Psalms 52, 9. I will praise you forever for what you have done. In the presence of your faithful people, I will put my hope in your name, for it is good. Would you stand and join the praise, join the praise team? Sing it louder, cause nothing has the power. 
seated. Children are dismissed. Well, we're in a series in the book of 2 Corinthians, and I've entitled this series Encouragement in Troubling Times. And I feel like the themes in this letter address many of the issues that we face today. And in this letter, Paul opens his heart to his readers and shares his struggles and the stresses and the spiritual perspective he has when life gets tough. So just a little bit of review in this letter He's writing to a troubled, rebellious church. Um, they've been on the verge of rejecting the teaching of uh, their founding pastor, who was the Apostle Paul, and also the authority of Jesus Christ as Jesus appointed Paul to be the Apostle to the Gentiles. And we certainly can learn some things from Paul's story, how to have a right attitude that leads to victory, even in the worst circumstances. Um, so if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Corinthians um, chapter 2. We're going to be picking up in verse 12. And verse 12 and 13 gives us a little bit of the background. And as I read it, we'll notice that there was um, just something that had overcome Paul when he was in this place called Troas in verses 12 and 13. It says, When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ... Even though the Lord opened a door for me, I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find my brother Titus. Instead, I said goodbye to them and left for Macedonia. And so what happened was Paul had, had left Ephesus and he'd gone on to preach the gospel in Troas. And Troas was a Roman colony north of Ephesus, about 10 miles from the great city of Troy. You probably all heard of uh, Troy or the Trojans. And this was in the province of Mysia. And so just like Paul had done on previous trips and journeys, he, he went there to preach the gospel. And he had open doors of opportunity. But also he was scheduled to have a meeting there with Titus. And if you remember from previous weeks, Titus was his associate and he had sent him to Corinth to report on the condition of the church. Uh, one commentator I read said, uh, Corinth was kind of like... Um, the rebellious teenager of the first century churches, that there was always something going on uh, there in Corinth. And so Paul was continuing his journey, went from Ephesus to Troas, and he was hoping to meet Titus, but Titus didn't arrive. And so despite the opportunities the Lord opened, he left and, and went to Macedonia. Um, and I don't know, I think I have um, a, a map and it just kind of give you a little idea on the next slide. Um, so basically, Ephesus is here, and so this is modern-day Turkey. So he went up to Troas, had quite a ministry there, and there was two ways to get to Corinth. Corinth is way down here. Uh, this is uh, Greece up here. And so you could either go um, by water, and you notice it's kind of a long route, or you could go by land this way. And so... Um, Paul is trying to figure out what's going on with Titus and where he's at, and he decides, well, I'm going to head over to, to Macedonia, which was to the west of where he was in Troas, and because uh, he, was, he was concerned. He wanted to see what was going on. It says that he had no peace of mind or, or no rest in his spirit, and we all probably can relate to that. There are times in our life where we have anxiety or we're burdened. Um, another word would be overwhelmed or, or discouraged because of the circumstances. And so he left this newly planted church that was seeming to, to be very responsive to the gospel and he went on to, to find Titus, to find out what was going on in Corinth. And this shows his love and concern for the Corinthians. And you know, that's important because their whole question was, why didn't Paul come back? He said he was going to come back and last week we talked about how 
false teachers had come in and they were telling them that, you see, he's, he's not fulfilling his promise. And so Paul's concerned about them. He's wondering what's going on so much so that this open field of ministry, he decides to go ahead and leave there and find Titus to figure out what's going on way over in Corinth. And you know, I think there's an application point for all of us that we can relate to is because of our love for others, we can experience a troubled heart when we aren't sure of their well-being. I don't know if you've experienced that in your own life, but when you have a concern for someone and they're going through a, a trial or a trouble, it hurts you. And you're concerned and you're anxious and you can't rest and you can't sleep. Any of you that are parents, have you ever had a sleepless night wondering about your kids? Uh, if you haven't, it's because your kids aren't teenagers yet. Maybe they're still real little. But we all go through that because that's just part of a, a parent's heart. And I'm sure even if you're not a parent, you've gone through things like that. And, and as far as we know, Paul wasn't a, a physical parent, but he was a spiritual parent. And he had this same concern over the well-being of his spiritual children. And you know, I think also there's the added burden of him being the one that founded that church and was there uh, with them for 18 months. And as your pastor, al along with our elders, we, we keep watch over you and we pray for you and we desire to see you grow and to be healthy. Uh, it's interesting in Hebrews 13, 17, it says, Obey your leaders and submit to them since they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account so that they can do this with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. That as spiritual leaders, our elder team, myself, we, we take seriously our, our role to, to be shepherds, to be um, ones that supervise and look over how you guys are doing. And so my, uh, my request would be, if you're struggling, let us know. I mean, we, we don't know. Just, uh, we can't read minds. We don't know what's going on sometimes. And so we, we meet almost every week um, and we pray for people in the church. We pray for the ministries of our church. And I know Paul had that heavy burden uh, and he talks about it throughout the New Testament in the letters that he writes that he has a, a burden for the churches. He's concerned about them. But in the midst of that and in the midst of all that he had gone through, whether it would be... Um, the riot in Ephesus or whether it be people trying to kill him or being jailed and all these different things, he found victory. And in these next few verses, 14 to 16, we triumph in Christ despite the troubles of life. And I hope you've had tastes of that. Uh, and there's a number of things that are part of this. And the first is having a thankful attitude. We can be thankful to God despite the hardships that we face. Look at uh, verses 14 through 16. It says, But thanks be to God who always leads us in Christ's triumphal procession and through us spreads the aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For to God we are the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To some we are an aroma of death leading to death, but to others an aroma of life leading to life. Who is adequate for these things. So he begins as he's pondering all these things he's going through, he begins with thanks. He says, thanks be to God. In other words, we, we can be thankful to God despite the hardships we face, no matter what kinds of things we go through. And in the face of his stress over the situation, what did he do? He didn't focus on the situation. He went to God to find the joy that only God can give. One of the things I think is helpful, there are verses that say things like rejoice in the Lord always and, and be thankful in every situation. And you know, you find yourself, you know, that's hard. That's hard to be thankful when difficult things come, when hardship comes, when, when um, anxiety producing situations come into your life. But the thing that was helpful to me is that we're not expected to be thankful for every situation we're supposed to be thankful in every situation. And that's a huge difference. In, in other words, when someone you love takes a turn for the worse, or, or maybe they pass away, or you lose a job, or a relationship that, that you've had seems to be um, on the outs, you're not necessarily thankful for that, but you're thankful in the midst of that. 
We can be thankful in every situation because God's there with us and because he's always worthy of praise. There's always something we can praise God for. Maybe you can't think of anything about your situation, but there's things about God's character. And there are things that God has done for us in the past that we can be thankful for, that we can have that thankful attitude. And we can know that even in the midst of uncertainty and questions, his plan, his work is being accomplished. Romans 8.28 is a famous verse I, I remember learning even as a child. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And the emphasis there is on all things. Not just when you're having a good day, not just when um, you, know, you got a raise at work or a promotion or your kid got all A's on their report card. It's easy to rejoice in those days. It's, it's easy to know that God's working for the good. But he says in all things. We can trust that God's at work in, in all things. And so my question for you today is, what are you facing that threatens to rob you of your joy. The enemy wants us to focus on our circumstances. Satan wants us to, to look away from God and be overwhelmed by the trials of life. And that can rob us of our joy. And so our response should be, first of all, get your focus off the situation. Focus again on the Lord. Give it to him. Trust him. Rediscover the joy that only he can give. And you know, that's something that Paul didn't just write about, but he actually put that into practice. In, in Acts chapter 16, there's a, an account I wanted to share with you, um, starting in verse 19. It says, um, they were preaching the gospel and they were, they were telling people to turn away from idols. And it says in verse 19, when... Uh, her owners realized that their hope of profit was gone. There was a girl that had this fortune-telling spirit, and they drove the spirit out of her. It says, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities, bringing them before the chief magistrates. They said, these men are seriously disturbing our city. They are Jews and are promoting customs that are not legal for us as Romans to adopt or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against them, and the chief magistrates stripped off their clothes, ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they threw them into jail, ordering the jailer to guard them carefully. Receiving such an order, he put them into the inner prison and secured their feet in the stocks. So imagine this. Um, Paul and Silas are preaching the gospel. They're doing what God wants them to do. There are people that are, that are coming to know the Lord. And the merchants are saying, this is bad for business. So they drag them out into the marketplace. They, they take off their, their garments and they, and they beat them. They beat them with rods and then they're thrown into jail and they have their, their feet um, chained up by, by um, these, these leg chains. And so in the midst of this, listen to their response. It says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. Those of you that are familiar with the story, you know what happens, that there's an earthquake and, and God frees them from the jail. But Paul and Silas didn't know that. They hadn't read the book of Acts yet. It wasn't written yet. But in the midst of their difficulty, their suffering, I'm sure they were in physical pain. What are they doing? They're praising God. They're, they're singing to God. And the reason is because they knew the promise of Romans 8, 28, that God was going to work it all out for good. They knew that in the midst of difficulty and hardship and, and physical hurt, that they could trust God. They knew that there was something to be thankful for, even when there wasn't a lot that was obvious to be thankful for, even when they were in pain. So the, the, the first thing to experience victory or triumph in the troubles of life is to have a thankful attitude. The second is to have a victorious perspective. Through Jesus Christ, God invites us to participate in his victory by following him. You'll notice in 2 Corinthians 2, at the end of verse 14, it says, Thanks be to God who always leads us in Christ's triumphal procession and through us spreads the aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. Well, just reading that, you might not really understand what he's talking about, 
But there's a, a key word there, and the key word is triumphal procession. Because you see, to understand this, you need to understand what happened in Rome. That there was an event called a Roman triumph. And it was like a parade. It was a celebration. Uh, it was an event to honor a Roman general who had defeated an enemy on the foreign soil for the empire. And you can see in this picture, it's a, it's a, a carving. And here's the Roman general, and he's in this chariot, and there are the horses, and there are those that are accompanying him, and there are some of his soldiers up there. And so basically what happened, this was to honor this Roman general because of his triumph over uh, Roman en uh, enemies. And so he would come in on a, a golden chariot, he'd be surrounded by his officers, and he'd be displaying the spoils of battle. And even often there were defeated enemy soldiers who were chained up that would be part of this procession as he went into the city of Rome. And these enemy soldiers were usually taken to the Circus Maximus and they were killed by wild beasts. And so as gross as that sounds and as bloody as that sounds, that was a celebration for the people of Rome because it was a reminder that they were having the victory over their enemies. And then usually following this parade were priests that were burning incense. And then the general's sons walked behind his chariot, sharing in his victory. So why does Paul use this picture of this parade, this triumph, this Roman triumph? The reason is because it, there's a parallel between what Jesus did and what the Romans honored in their victorious generals. Jesus came into enemy territory, which is this earth, this planet. And he defeated the enemy. He defeated Satan and freed those enslaved in sin. And he led his followers to share in this victory. So for us, the application is because Jesus Christ has won the victory, we don't need to fight the battle in our own strength. It isn't up to us to somehow figure out a way to be victorious in the midst of difficulty but we follow him in the victory he's already won. Our enemy has been defeated. The victory has already been won. We need to grasp hold of it and trust God in the midst of it. A third is eternal impact. God uses us to spread the good news which invites a response. A response that will determine each person's eternal destiny. Can you think of anything more important than that? There are times probably all of us in our life we say, are we making a difference in the world? Uh, maybe you've retired or maybe you're uh, in a place where you've lost your job or maybe your kids are out of the house now and so for years your main responsibility was raising your kids or going to work or, or something else and there's been a change for you and you ask yourself, am I making an impact? And, and what Paul reminds us here is that we have an eternal impact, that we have a, a responsibility, that, that we have a duty just in living out our Christian lives. Um, our lives and our message that we share are like an aroma of the burning incense at the triumph parade. You'll notice what he says. Um, he says, uh, through us spreads the aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For to God we are the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To some we are an aroma of death leading to death, but to others an aroma of life leading to life. This is an amazing thing that God has given us, that because of our lives, our testimony, the message that we can share with others, it's like that parade. If you remember, I said at the back of the parade there were priests that were burning incense, and that as they were headed to the Circus Maximus, there was this sense of life for those that won and this sense of impending doom for those that were going to be killed in the Colosseum or in the, in the circus. And so he's kind of describing this like our lives are like that incense that's being burnt in this parade. And for some, when they smelled the incense, they knew this meant victory, that their armies had won. And for others that smelled the incense, they knew that meant defeat that these soldiers would ultimately be killed um, in this public arena. And it's the same thing with the gospel. 
After hearing the invitation of the gospel, people are given a choice. A choice to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior or to reject him. And to those that reject him, it's an aroma of death. The gospel, like that incense, is, is a scent that you can smell, but it's not a scent of life for those that reject him. It's a scent of death. And to those that accept him, it's an aroma of life. It's the beginning of a whole new life in fellowship with God. And if you think about it, I think our response is very similar to Paul's at the end of verse 16. He says, who's adequate for these things? Can you imagine having that privilege, that responsibility, that duty of living in such a way that people see your life and they will have to answer the question, do I want what they have? Do I want Jesus Christ? Do, do I want to know him? Do I want to have the eternal life that he can give? Or no, I'm going to turn away. I'm going to reject that. Who's equal to this task? And Paul talks about that in the next verse, but also throughout this book, talking about the ministry that God has given us. And in verse 17, he reminds us that God's mission is only carried out by those who are sincere and sent by him. It says, for we do not market the word of God for profit like so many. On the contrary, we speak with sincerity in Christ as from God and before God. He's telling us that, that all of us who know Jesus have a mission. We're all ambassadors, and he'll, he'll talk about that in, in later chapters. And ambassadors are representatives. So I don't know if you've thought about it, but if you claim the name of Jesus Christ, if you say, yes, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus, I believe in him, then you're his representative no matter where you go. It isn't walking into a church only. It's also in your neighborhood. It's at school. It's um, on your job. It's when you're on vacation. We, we don't ever get time off where we say we're not God's representative. We always are if we know him as our Lord and Savior. But he says we're not like salesmen looking for personal profit. Some translations say hucksters or peddlers. They're the people that are in it for the money. And probably, unfortunately, we've all seen televangelists like that where the whole thing is about money. That, you know, if you do this, you know, if you give this amount of money, then I'll do this. And um, he says, we're not like that. We're, we're not in it for the money. Um, we're not peddlers. We're not hucksters. We're, we're not in it for personal profit. Instead, he says that we're to be sincere. We speak with sincerity in Christ. And we talked about that last week, about sincerity meaning the real thing that is genuine, it's, it's honest, it's not pretending, it's, it's not fake, it's not trying to pull something over on someone. And so as we live out our, our Christian life, we're to do so in a sincere way. And you know, um, just this morning, it, it kind of reminded me as I was um, on Facebook, I've been kind of following um, the condition of a mentor of mine, Dr. Larry Crabb, he has cancer and he's on his last days and he passed away this morning. And the thing about Dr. Crabb that I appreciated so much was he was real. He was honest. He was sincere. And there's something about that that frees you up to be real. Because I think all too many Christians feel like they have to put on a mask. When they come to church or wherever they are, they always have to be Praise the Lord, everything's wonderful, even though they're hurting inside. And Dr. Crabb was not that way. And Paul says, we're not to be that way. We're to be real with people. And that's what he's doing in this letter. He's saying, you know, we're, we're just feeling so much pain that we're struggling. We're in despair, he even says, in certain situations. But in the midst of that, we look to God. And so rather than having perfect shiny, squeaky clean lives, we can be real. We can say, yeah, sometimes I doubt. Sometimes I struggle. Sometimes I don't want to smile. Sometimes I don't want to say praise the Lord or, or sing a song of, of praise and worship. Sometimes I'm really hurting inside. But yet in the midst of that, deep down I can thank God because of who he is. And he tells us also that, that we're sent from God, that that he's, he's commissioned us. 
Um, in Matthew 28, 19, and 20 is the Great Commission, which is given to all of Jesus' followers. It says, Go and therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. We all have a responsibility in some way or another, uh, through prayer or maybe through teaching or maybe through singing or maybe through writing letters or giving, uh, encouraging. There's a lot of ways that we can help make disciples. But we all have a responsibility in furthering God's kingdom. And he says we should do that in a sincere way, but also in a way that we sense that calling, that we are sent from God. We're accountable to him. We don't have to worry about what people think of us. That's one thing that I appreciate about the Apostle Paul is that he wrote what God wanted him to write. He preached what God wanted him to preach. He didn't worry if it was going to offend someone. He didn't try to soften it up so it would be a little easier to receive he spoke the truth. You know, one thing that I heard a, a long time ago that I really like this phrase is that we live for an audience of one. That's God. We don't live to please one another. We don't live to please our boss or, you know, somebody that's important in our, life, in our lives. We, we live for his approval. We live for an audience of one. And when we do that, we can have thankful hearts. We can know that we have victory in the midst of difficulty. We, we can know that we can be sincere and not fake. That we can share our struggles. That we can be honest in asking people to pray for us when we're hurting. And that in turn, we can do that for others as well. We can be Jesus' hands and feet for those that are hurting and need help. Let's bow our heads. Perhaps you've come this morning and deep down you're not sure if you have a relationship with God. And I'd like to urge you today to not leave until you know that you've put your trust in him and you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior. Simply by acknowledging your sin and your need and turning from that and admitting that Jesus Christ died for my sins that he rose again from the dead and I believe in what he did for me and I now accept him as my Lord and Savior. I turn my life over to him. And if you've done that today, then you can know that you not only have eternal life, but that you have a relationship with God through Jesus and that then the next step is to grow in that, to learn more about what that means, how to live that out, how to be that ambassador for Jesus Christ, how to use your gifts to serve other people and how to be a, a positive influence, to be that incense to life. And so I ask you, if you don't know Jesus, to put your trust in him today and receive him as your Lord and Savior. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the example of the Apostle Paul and how vulnerable and real he was in sharing his struggles. How he, as he wrote to this troubled church, he didn't write them off, but he, he expressed his love and told them what they needed to do and, and how they could repent and be right with you. And Lord, I, I just pray that each one of us would take seriously the responsibilities that you've given us. You've given each one of us people in our lives that we can influence, that we can have an impact on. And, and rather than seeing our jobs as just a place where we make a living, that we can see them actually as a mission field. And as, our, uh, as we go to school, that we can see our friendships and the other kids in the class as people that you might want to touch through our lives. And for all of us, Lord, I just pray that we would walk close with you that we'd keep short accounts, that we'd have a clear conscience before you and that we would continually look to you for the strength and the encouragement we need. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So before we sing the song, I do want to wish...
my best of luck to you and Sean, and thank you for all that you've done and contributed over the years of uh, praise and worship, and uh, you'll be missed very much. So, but, uh, Why don't we all stand together as we all sing hymn number 447, Freely Free. Anderson, will you please close us? <laughs> 